Hello and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's Food Star webinar to a very hot topic in European food legislation. In the next uh, 45 minutes, you will uh, receive a presentation about information to consumers focus on labeling based on the regulation 1169 2011 on the provision of food information to consumers. When this regulation was introduced in the year 2011, this was a huge paradigm shift in European food legislation. Everything which was correlated to food labeling for more than 50 years was now shifted to the new character of food information for interested consumers and therefore with drastic changes in the content and the layout of labeling which was needed uh, to be printed on food labels. Anna Oliveira from the company Frulact, uh, based in Portugal, will give us this speech. Uh, she is an expert in this field and I'm very interested to hear her view and her insights about this uh, topic. Before we will start with the presentation, I will give you just uh, a small technical overview about using this webinar, about using the webinar panel and uh, later on you will receive some slides about this Foodstar project. It is a European funded project, therefore it pays for this webinar and therefore we will also dedicate some slides to the project. After the presentations we will have a small discussions about the question you have stated and when you leave the webinar you will see uh, an internet mask on your screen where you can fill out the feedback form you can do this also via email because later on you will also be forwarded an email by GoToWebinar to fill out the, uh, the feedback form. You can do it via internet directly after the webinar or via email later on. My name is Julian Drausinger. I'm a food technologist and based in Vienna in the Austrian Food Research Institute, which is a private non-profit research institute dealing with a lot of services for the food field, for food operators and food processors and the retail. So we have a lot of customers also dealing with food information of course. Uh, we have a lot of uh, samples to be analyzed every year. We are giving audit auditings and inspections and of course we are also a part of the European research area in the food field. Let's go to the technical aspects. You will see on the right side of your screen the control panel of uh, GoToWebinar. The area down there which is marked now is uh, the area where you can post questions. You just have simply to click in the field with the mouse. You will post a question. I can see it on my second screen and after the speech, after the lecture, I will forward the question to the uh, lecturer and uh, Anna will answer the questions then later on immediately. If you want to see everything from the presentation and not the control panel, you can minimize it with this red arrow. If you want to have the full screen in front, everything back behind, you can do it here. If you want to raise hand, you can push this button. On another window, I can see if any one of you participants raises the hand and then I can get into contact with you. I urgently recommend that you raise the hand only if you face technical pro problems and not to raise questions because uh, if we are a number of participants, if we start to raise questions during the speech, this will be a whole lot of mess. So I really recommend, please, if you have a question, write it down in the question window, pass it over to me and we will handle all the questions at the end of the speech. Mute, unmute, micro. This is just for you as an additional information because all micros are muted. Uh, I do not want to have 20 people or more speaking at the same time. So if you unmute the micro, I do see this in my control panel and I will mute it again. So sorry for this, but I really want to have it quiet for Anna so that we can understand her perfectly. The session will be recorded. So if you have some friends or interested parties who cannot join today, the session will be recorded and later on will be made accessible on the EU Foodstar web page, which I will show you in the end. So if you want to see it a second time or if you want to recommend it to another person, you can do this and uh, give a hint to the EU Foodstar web page where uh, the, the session, the recorded session will be made accessible. Now we switch over to the EU Foodstar project. 
EU Foodstuff Project is a uh, project applied in the Erasmus Plus Knowledge Alliance scheme, which of course gives the focus of the project knowledge alliances for knowledge transfer and also for the transfer of information and know-how. Why is this project necessary? Because we have even an existing problem, especially in the food field, where we, my institute and me, are now dealing with more than 20 years in this problem. We do not have the right patent solution now, but Foodstar will be another puzzle part to overcome these hurdles. We have the research side on the one side, we have the industry side on the other side. Both have some requirements, both have some needs. Universities, of course, need publications to be ranked in the worldwide R&D area. Their focus lies on research, of course. We do want universities to have research. We do want universities to have fundamental uh, mechanisms to be uh, researched, to be focused on. On the other side, the industry needs efficient, quick, available, and realizable solutions. They should be there in the minute they need it. They should be there especially tailor-made to their needs. They should be in their possession. So the IPRs are, want to be prolonged in the, in, the, in the hands of the industry. And of course, the time is money. Time constraints is always a huge issue. So we have this gap, which is obvious and its presence. I think everybody knows about these problems, but we now want to be a step forward, a step closer to closing this gap in the Foodstar centers, in the Foodstar system. Foodstar is not only dedicated to be a project with a two years lifetime and after the funding is ended, it's gone. It's a, a long lasting strategy behind. We want to have a long lasting partnership between participating companies now, later also with more companies and also with the university partners and the transfer partners. Therefore, Foodstar is dedicated to very clear and simple targets and expectations which are able to be fulfilled. We do not want to say that we solve everything and all the problems of the world. Foodstar is a network throughout Europe. We have seven universities inside. We have three food companies like Frulac, who will give the lecture today. And we have 11 multipliers and training provider centers in the consortium. The University of uh, Agriculture and Applied Sciences in Vienna is the coordinator. We have universities in France, Portugal, in Germany, UK, and Italy with us on board. We have the company Frulac which is a worldwide uh, uh, leading operator in fruit preparations and flavorings. We have GB Foods based in Spain, also operating worldwide with their products. And as associated partner and testing partner, we have a very small Swiss company called Nestlé. Maybe you have heard of them somewhere before. The consortium multipliers and training providers, it's us as a introduced our institute before. We have another institutes in this range in France, Italy, Spain, in Great Britain and Portugal. We have uh, the umbrella of uh, the Iseki Food Association behind, which is a worldwide network. We have the FOST for the industry related uh, and space a network of uh, more than 15 food federations for industry related issues and the Eroica for the contact to a worldwide student network. Foodstar is not only somewhere up in the air or in the internet, Foodstar is also acting on hands, real, in reality, on, in, in diverse cities. We have some physical hubs, which are really physical bureaus with people working there, people acting there who have some kind of infrastructure. They are based in the countries and the cities of the partnering uh, partners of the consortium. Vienna, Hohenheim, Germany, Paris, Leeds, Puerto, Teramo in Itali Italy and Barcelona in Spain. So if you want to be in contact with us, if you have some needs or you have something to provide and you want to uh, benefit from our network which was established in the Foodstar network, please come to our hubs and contact us. And if you want to give us any feedback about webinars, about other contents, if you have some recommendations, please do not hesitate to send us an email to office at iseki-food.net. Now we come to this, what you have been waiting for. 
Food Information, Anna Oliveira. She is the coordinator of the regulatory and specification team in the company Frulact. She is graduated food engineer like me and uh, for more than 10 years she is now acting in Frulact where she uh, is uh, affected with food legislation of course every day and especially with uh, food uh, information and now I would like to hand over the screen to Anna if my mouse would like to allow me this. So Anna, now you are the moderator. I will also open the microphone for you. Anna, are you there? Yes, good afternoon. Hello. Hello. And I, know, I, I now would kindly ask you to start the presentation because the screen is yours, you just have to accept and to start the presentation. Okay. Thank you so much for assisting to this webinar on information to consumer. Um, uh, Anna, sorry, I, we still cannot see the presentation. No. Maybe you, ha you have to activate to, to the, the share screen button. I, I did it. I accepted mm -hmm. the, the share screen. Okay, so my, my question to the audience, could you please give me a small feedback via the chat window? Can you see Anna's presentation? Does anyone see Anna's presentation? Please give me a small feedback. No, they just can't hear her, can hear you. They cannot see the screen. Okay. So um, maybe no, I will take... No. I just take back once again uh, the screen and then give it back to you again. Maybe it works okay. then later on. Thank you. So, so now once again, 10 minutes ago at the technical check it worked, so it should work right now. So now I will give the acceptation to you. So I have accepted it. Nah, now it's there. It's there. It's yeah. there. Perfect. It works. So now I'm quiet. I will mute my micro. I will give back my webcam and the floor is yours for the next 30 minutes. Food information, Anna Oliveira. Good luck. Thank you. So, as I was saying, thank you for assisting to this webinar on information to consumers. So, this regulation, 1169 from 2011, combine two previous directives. Directive 2013 on labeling presentation and advertising of foodstuffs and Directive 9496 regarding nutrition labeling for foodstuffs. Being a regulation, it has immediate implementation as law in all member states, which avoids different national interpretations. This regulation sets the basis for the assurance of a high level of consumer protection and it establishes the general principles governing food information. I would like to start with Article 7, Fair Information Practices. Food information should not be misleading, particularly in which regards the characteristics of the food by suggesting that food possesses special characteristics when similar food possesses the same characteristics, by suggesting the presence of a particular ingredient when it is substituted for a different component or a different ingredient. Food information should always be accurate, clear and easy to understand for the consumer. In Chapter 1, in general provisions, there are a group of definitions. We are not going through them today. I just let them here in case it could be useful. I will just make a remark on engineering nanomaterial. The definition is no longer here in Article 2. It was deleted and replaced by Regulation 2015-2283. This webinar will focus on mandatory food information and its list of mandatory particulars. The list has 12 entries. 
name of the food, list of ingredients, ingredients causing allergies or intolerances, quantity of certain ingredients, net quantity, date of minimum durability, special storage conditions, identification of food business operator, country of origin, instructions for use, alcoholic strength by volume for beverages, and nutrition declaration. Detailed provisions on mandatory particulars are laid down in section two. We will focus in four of them. Lists of ingredients, ingredients causing allergies, quantity of certain ingredients, also known as quid, and nutrition declaration. Starting with lists of ingredients, which is mandatory, the list of ingredients should be headed or preceded by the word ingredients or a sentence with the word ingredients in it. All the ingredients should be in descendant order of weight. Ingredients should be designated by specific name and if in the form of nanomaterials, it should be clearly indicated as nano in brackets after the ingredients. Here we have an example. We have the having with the word ingredient and then the list of all the ingredients of this product. There are some ingredients that can be omission. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The Annex 7 of this regulation sets out technical rules. I'll give you some examples of them to be clear. So in part A, we have provisions concerning the indication of ingredients by descending order. Part B regards the designation of ingredients by the name of a category. Part C regards ingredients by the name of that category followed by a specific name or E number. Part D regards flavorings. And part E related with compound ingredients. In this example, we will see, for instance, that ingredients in concentrate form reconstituted during manufacture may be listed in order of way before concentration. This is set down in part A, and it's the example of Sicilian lemon juice. Also, when we see color anthocyanins, this follows part C that states that the ingredients belonging to one of those categories laid down in Annex C must be designated as category, in this case color, and then a specific name or E number. Here, it is the specific name, anthocyanins. However, if it was color E 163, it will be also correct. Part A has other um, examples. Uh, for instance, when we have ingredients constituting less than 2%, they may be listed in a different order after the other ingredients, not necessarily in descending order. A few more examples, again from part A. Here we have vegetable oils and in brackets sunflower and rapeseed. This follows Annex Part A, where refined oils of vegetable origin may be grouped as vegetable oils, followed by specific vegetable origin. Milk proteins, also in the label, is another example here set in Part B, where it says that all types of milk proteins, caseins, caseinates, and whey proteins, may be designated as milk proteins. Two examples from Part C regarding additives. In the first one, we have the category, anti-caking, and then E number, E339, and then another one with color, where we have the category color, and then specific name, curcumin. An example on Part E, compound ingredients. Compound ingredients may be indicated under its own designation in terms of its overall weight and followed by a list of its ingredients. In this case, we have a multi-fruit preparation 
and then, in brackets, the composition of the multi-fruit preparation. Many other rules are set in those five parts of the Annex 7. Regarding the omission of the list of ingredients, some products don't need the list of ingredients. These are fresh fruits and vegetables, as long as they are not peeled, cut, or other similar treatments. Carbonated water, where the description mentioned carbonated. Fermentation vinegars, where no other ingredient is added. Same from cheese, butter, fermented milk, and cream, where no ingredient added besides the one that are needed to produce these products. And foods consisting of a single ingredient, as long as the name of the food ingredient uh, clearly identify its nature. Regarding the constitutes of food from the list of ingredients, there are some possibilities for omission too. Please take into account that these rules is not valid for substances or products causing allergies or intolerances. These products, these substances, may, shall always be presented in the label. So, which are the cases where the omission of constituents of food is possible? where the constituents of an ingredient, which have been temporarily separated during manufacturing, is reintroduced, but not in excess of their original proportions. I'm thinking about the cream that is uh, separated from the milk and then reintroduced to standardize the milk. Food additives and enzymes whose presence is due to the fact they are containing one ingredient of the food, provided that they serve no technological function in the finished products. Additives and enzymes used as processing aids, carriers and substances which are not food additives but are used in the same way, substances which are not food additives but are used in the same way as processing aids, and water, where is used during manufacturing processes for reconstitution of an ingredient, or in the case of a liquid medium which is not normally consumed. So in these six situations, it is possible to omit the ingredients. We will go through the list of mandatory particulars. Now, to the quantity of certain ingredients or categories of ingredients, also known as quid. The quantitative indication of ingredient is required when the ingredient appears in the name of the food or is usually associated with the name by the consumer. For instance, if we have a Sicilian lemon and raspberry yogurt, the lemon and the raspberry must be quantified in the label, and they are, as you can see. For instance, in the case of ratatouille, where consumer expects to have vegetables, they are present in the ingredient lists, and they are quantified, 71%. We have a special case here with cream crackers. Cream is in the name of the product, but it's not expected to be present by the consumer. So, you don't have cream in the ingredient list. Another situation where the quantitative indication of ingredients is mandatory is when the ingredient is emphasized on the labeling by words, pictures, or graphics. In this example, we have raspberry, mustard pot, and hazelnut. And as you can see, the three of them are 25 in the label. Mascarpone, 6%, raspberries, 6%, and hazelnut, 3%. The other example with fruits, we have forest fruit, 2.2%. The quantitative indication is also required 
when the ingredient distinguishes it from products with which it may be confused because of its name or appearance. The example I have here is marzipan, where the percentage of almond is required. And why? Because the composition, although being different in different member states, it's always marked, is usually marked as marzipan. That's why the percentage of almond is important. Once again, not to mislead the consumer. There are some exceptions, of course. The quantitative indication is not required for certain ingredients where the quantities of which must already appear on the labeling under union provisions. For instance, the fruit content of fruit nectar in fruit juices or which is used in small quantities for purposes of flavoring. Small quantities is not exactly defined. Usually it is considered less than 2%. Also, the quantitative indication is not required when the ingredients, while appearing in the name of the food, its variation in quantity is not essential to characterize the food. For instance, corn in cornflakes or garlic in garlic bread. Annex 8 uh, also have more technical rules and other specific cases if you want to explore. Once again, so we don't lose ourselves, here's the list of mandatory particulars. We are now going through ingredients causing allergies or intolerances. These ingredients are listed in Annex 2 of the Regulation 1169-2011. This is the list. So we have cereals containing gluten, crustaceans, eggs, fish, peanuts, soybeans, milk, nuts, celery, mustard, sesame, sulfur dioxide and sulfates higher than 10 milligrams per kilo or 10 milligrams per liter, lupin and mollusks. Sulfur dioxide is in fact the only one of these that has a minimum content for being declared. There are, again, some exceptions. In case of cereals containing gluten, for instance, wheat-based glucose syrups including dextrose, or with base maltodextrins are labeling exceptions and they don't have to be designated as allergens. And how should we label these substances in the label? These substances should be indicated in the list of ingredients with a clear reference to the name of the substance. In this example, we have milk, hazelnut, wheat and soya. Also, the name of the substance should be emphasized. Font, style, background color. In this example, we have it in bold. If we have several ingredients that originate from a single substance, the label should make it clear for each ingredient. And as you can see it, milk is repeated uh, four times with two times, and we should repeat it as many times as needed. In the absence of a list of ingredients, and there are a few products that don't need it, it shall comprise the word contains followed by the name of substance. For instance, in cheese, we don't have the ingredient list, the label should have contains milk in bold or underlined or in other way that emphasizes it. Also, the indication of the substance is not required when the name of the food clearly refers to the substance, for instance, milk. We'll go now through nutrition declaration, also a mandatory particular for some foods. Nutrition declaration is a mandatory group of information and a voluntary one. 
they both should be in the same field of vision. The mandatory information is energy value, fat, saturates, carbohydrates, sugar, protein, and salt. Regarding salt, a statement indicating that the salt content is exclusively due to the presence of naturally occurring sodium, it's possible. Voluntary information, it's all of or one of the following. Monounsaturates, polyunsaturates, polyols, starch, fiber, and vitamins and minerals. The way we express this information um, varies. So, as I said, all of the information should be in the same field of vision, and it's mandatory to be expressed per 100 grams or 100 milliliters. Uh, for vitamins and minerals, it's mandatory to have information uh, per percentage of reference intake. The nutritional declaration can be repeated in the front panel. And in this situation, we have two options. We can express only the energy value or the energy value and some nutrients, not any. These four, fat, saturates, sugar, and salt. And if we choose this option, we should label the four of them. Some examples, but before that, if we have, if we want to express uh, the information proportion, it should comply some conditions. The person should be easily recognizable. It should be quantified in the label and the number of portions in the package must be stated. Sometimes portions can be replaced by consumption unit. It's not necessarily the same thing, but it's possible. The calculation is based on the conversion factors listed in Annex 14. It is not mandatory that information results on the laboratory analysis. Bibliography is also acceptable. And now a few examples. So in the same field of vision, we have the mandatory information, energy and nutrients per 100 grams. In this case, we have also an optional information, the energy and nutrients per reference intake. Because we have the information per reference intake, it's mandatory to have a statement, reference intake of an average adult. And because we have calcium and vitamins, it's mandatory to have the information of these by percentage of reference intake. If we want to repeat the nutrition information in the front panel, as I said, we have two options. In this one, they choose to have only the energy information per 100 grams as mandatory, and also we have the information per portion and reference intake. In this particular case, the portion is also 100 grams. Another example. As before, mandatory energy and nutrients per 100 gram. And we have optionally the information per portion that in this case it's in fact consumption unit, it's a discrete. And in the information for reference intake. Because we have the information per percentage of reference intake, we should have the mandatory statement of the reference intake of an average adult. And if we want to repeat the information in the front panel, in this case, they choose to have the energy and the four nutrients. And here we have the 
mandatory information per 100 grams and the optional information per portion and per reference intake. I will give you now some useful links. The regulation is quite extensive with lots of exceptions and details. It's not possible to talk about everything in 20 minutes or one morning. Maybe it's not enough also. There's so many exceptions. But I left you with some useful links. I hope it can help you if you have some doubts. Thank you for assisting. And now it works. So, uh, sorry for this delay. There was some technical difficulties on my PC. Muy obrigado for your presentation, Anna. Thank you very much for your insight in the details of EU food information. Uh, it, uh, as you said, it is impossible to make uh, such a uh, presentation in half an hour. Usually in Austria, we have at minimum a two-day seminar just for the basics of food information. Uh, well, we are now at the end of the presentation. Are there any questions from the audience which you would like to be answered right now? So please do not hesitate. Please uh, give us your feedback. Please use the question area in the dashboard if you want to state some questions because now there is the possibility for us to answer some of them. Uh, I have one question to you, Anna. Um, as you mentioned, the recommended daily uh, the RDR, uh, in, the, in the end of your presentation, uh, I think two weeks ago, uh, some multinational companies uh, gave uh, an official announcement uh, that they would like to uh, introduce a kind of traffic light system beside the RDA labeling. Uh, have you heard of this? Or you as a multinational acting company, do you see any improvement if there is another labeling with green, green, red, and yellow light, uh, or would you like to stay at the RDA system? Um, I, I heard about it. I think, in fact, that the, the the light signal are been talked for some while now, but it has been in the middle of some discussion. I really, I think it would be helpful for the consumer if it's clear because in the label you have so so much information that if you have uh, a place where they can just get the most important information it could be interesting as long as that information does not mis mislead the, the, the consumer for example highlighting um, low fats and in a product that has a high content of salt, for instance. So I think it could be useful uh, if make, made with, with some caution, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I have one question for you from Tamara. I do not want to spell the last name because I think for me it's impossible. Sorry for this. Uh, the question is, just to clarify, if maltodextrin is uh, originated from wheat, maltodextrin based out of wheat, has it to be labeled as an allergen or not? So does it comply to the allergen rule if maltodextrin is originated from wheat, because wheat is uh, a base, the basis, has it to be labeled as an allergen or not? No. Maltodextrin is, is an exception because, um, in fact, it's in, in Annex 2, it's in point one uh, b uh, The situation is, during the manufacturing of maltodextrin, the protein causing the allergy 
was reduced to a point it no longer caused the allergy, so it don't need, in Europe, this is European regulation, um, it doesn't need to be labeled as cereal containing gluten, as wheat in this case. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We have another question from Pedro. It's related to syrups. syrups. Are syrups based out of cereals, not to be declared as allergens? So syrups made out of cereals. Once again, there are some exceptions. For instance, glucose syrups based on barley, they don't need to be um, labeled as allergens. The same thing from wheat. Uh, and these are the two um, exceptions that they are listed in the, in the regulation. Always, if we have, I do that every, every time, when we have some doubts, and sometimes the regulation is not so clear, um, I always count on my suppliers. I talk to them and ask for their feedback on my doubts. So it's always a, a good idea to talk with our suppliers and re yes, rely yes. on technical data sheets. Indeed, this is always a good idea <laughs> to get some feedback from the ones you, uh, where you purchase because then you have a stepwise approach and a stepwise back check. This is a very good strategy. So as I see no further questions right now, before we come to the end of this webinar, I would like uh, to give uh, you just an insight in the Foodstar web page. Uh, we have here uh, under www.food-star.eu uh, the homepage and there you have the submenu events and webinars and if you click on these webinars uh, button you will see the upcoming webinars, uh, today's webinar, tomorrow and the next ones and the past webinars. The past webinars, this is the area where you can once again see uh, the whole uh, 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 presentation because it's recorded as I mentioned before and also you can uh, watch the slides in a PDF file uh, uh, in this area. So if you want to go back to the webinar, to the presentation, please go to www.food-star.eu and then to the events webinar button. And we have a last question. Uh, I may forward it to you, Anna. It's a longer question. In some products, for example, vegan ice cream, it is claimed 30% less saturated fat and below the label, it usually says that it is compared with the similar product. On which benchmark they base the calculations to make these claims? So it's referred to the 30% a requirement uh, on comparable products. Uh, can you say if there is any benchmark or any orientation mark where you count on this 30% reduction? I don't really know the exact answer for that question. What I know is sometimes uh, the company has different products and they compare with a product they already have in the market. So they are comparing with their own product. That, thing, that I know it exists. I don't really know if it can be done in some other way. Probably it does, but I would have to check it. Sorry. Yeah, I think this, this is also the approach we do have here in Central Europe. Usually companies make uh, a research in their own product database and look for comparable products in this product uh, field. Or you can also make some comparable uh, uh, research with products already on the market. So I, I do not think that there is a real benchmark officially, official benchmark for this. Uh, it's a, let's say, a kind of market research in uh, the specific field of products you are dealing with. So as I do not see any further questions have been stated, I just wait some seconds if anybody would like to post the very final question. You are just invited to do this, we are here for you, so please use the possibility. 
Okay, I do not see any further question indicated in my question mark field. So then I would like to say goodbye to you. Thank you for your interest in today's webinar for the issue of food information. Muy obrigado. Back to you, Anna, that you gave this speech and that we could profit from your expertise and your experience. And I would like to announce the next Food Star webinar, which is tomorrow, about marketing strategies and the importance of labeling and trust in the supply chain. And next week we have a, media, a microbiological webinar on Bacillus cereus. Then we have ESO, ESO 17 or 25 for laboratories and also seen previous for beginners for, uh, before the end of the pre-holiday season. So then I will finish this webinar right now. Thank you for your interest in this webinar. Goodbye. Please use the Foodstar webpage and I hope that we will see you again soon in one of the upcoming webinars.